So we will continue with uh, right, uh, one dimensional flow. So the governing equation that we had was this. <coughs> And uh, we basically said that we could discretize it using FTCS, right? Discretize it using FTCS as QP at Q plus one as being QP at Q minus delta T by two delta X, PP Q plus one, PP Q p plus 1 q and is e p minus 1 q. I am using central difference, okay, just to recollect what we did in the last class. <coughs> and then we said that if you look at uh, two grid lines, this is at q, this is at q plus 1. These were the boundary points. Right, I will draw a few interior points just to, I am not going to draw a whole lot of them just for the sake of this discussion, I will draw a few, few interior points. So it is clear that we can do FTCS right using that stencil, no problem. We have everything at Q and we can determine the value at Q plus 1. The difficulty is when we get to determining the value right one shot of the boundary on both ends on both ends determining the value one shot of the boundary requires values at the boundary right it requires values at the boundary fine and this clearly the way FTCS works since we are going to do this this and we are going to use them to determine the interior points this clearly is a problem we have to solve because when we take the next time step when we go from q plus 1 to q plus 2 we are going to have the same difficulty we are not determining these points okay we are not finding out what these values are and what do we need at these places we need the q I need q at this point I need q at that point I need all okay so because we were in the situation we decided that we look at the physical problem right? actually because so far we have just been dealing with the chalk dust we have been working only with the theory. So we said the physical problem just to recollect because it is a one dimensional flow if I remember right I took a pipe of length L right and there was a valve on one end where you place the valve will only determine the initial conditions right. I should not say will only determine, it will determine the initial condition. So if you have the valve here, then whatever this is open right on this side to the atmosphere, you typically you would have P ambient prescribed on that, on that side. So the initial condition would be whatever the ambient condition is right, since the valve is on this side, the valve is on the other side, it would be whatever is in the chamber right. And here we have total pressure and total temperature these are typical conditions that you would use right if you are performing an experiment am I making sense in a gas dynamics lab okay and uh, it is not a very exciting even that experiment is not a very exciting experiment but still for, a, for, the, for our purposes it is simple enough that we can play around with it. So the physics of the problem requires as I pointed out in the last class three conditions right the physics of the problem requires three conditions. Uh, prescribing T ambient here does not really do anything for you unless of course uh, you need it the T ambient here you require in order to determine the initial condition but as a boundary condition it does not do anything for you okay you understand it is the pressure difference that is going to drive see this is just like normally when you say that you have uh, let me think of a situation. So if you think of all the uh, uh, sources of power that we have uh, the most of the sources of power that we have where we compress a fuel air mixture and we add energy right we add uh, we ignite it there is combustion and then there is expansion the process always involves compression 
expansion. <coughs> you understand what I am saying? If I were just to create a, a fireball in the open and raise the temperature of all the air, we are ignoring gravity here, all that will happen is the temperature of all the air will go up, right. In order in, in this room, if I were to raise the temperature, the temperature in the room will go up. There is no change in pressure, nothing of that sort. You actually need, so I need a lower pressure at one end, a higher pressure here and the pressure drives the air and we extract the energy from the fluid. That is why we always in thermodynamics deal with enthalpy and not directly with, not directly with pressure or temperature, right. Because you need the pressure gradient in order to drive, to start the motion so that you can extract the energy. Having the temperature alone, right, uh, through mechanical processes is not enough. Am I making sense? Okay. So in that sense, it is the pressure difference that is going to drive the flow. It is the pressure difference that is driving the flow. Is that fine? Right. So in this side, we can measure total temperature and this total temperature will basically do what? What does that total temperature do? Does it determine anything? Do we need it? So you go back to your gas dynamics and see why I need to prescribe the total temperature there. So P ambient, P naught, T naught and this problem can actually be worked using gas dynamics, fine, okay. From the mathematical point of view, we have already said that because we have a time derivative, we have a dou Q dou T term, because of the dou Q dou T term at T for some given T, we will take T equals 0, at T equals 0, I need a condition. So I need, I have an initial condition for all spatial locations. And I have a dou E dou X term, right. So for all, I have a Q at T equals 0 and I have a dou E dou X term, I have first derivative. So integration in my mind will give me three constants of integration which have to be determined and P naught, T naught and P ambient are given. So both physically and mathematically well determined, okay. It is just that our FTCS requires that I need a Q at this point and a Q at that point, fine. And consequently, I need to determine something here and something there, is that okay, right. The experiment, thought experiment we are running yesterday was if P ambient was P naught, P ambient was P naught as I just indicated there would be no flow and if I started to lower, if there is some mechanism by which I could lower P ambient, right. If I have another pressure vessel here or something of that sort, I start to lower P ambient, then a flow field will be set up. So the effect, if I look at the first, if I look at the, this interface, if I look at this interface, the valve is open. So if I lower the P naught, P A, P ambient, the effect will be that there will be a U set up here because of the lower, lower P ambient, right. So presumably this boundary condition communicates itself here through an increase in U, fine. I am just giving you a hand waving argument. So you want three quantities, you want three quantities here, you have only P naught, T naught. I am saying here is a way by which we can do it. So what we do is from the first interior grid point, maybe I go back here, from the first interior grid point. So whatever I have here, I copy the U to this point. I extrapolate the U to that point, is that okay? So this is a very naive way of doing this, but this is the first cut, as I said, this is a, this is a first, we, we will see whether, how, how we can improve, we can improve, right. I copy the U here. You could also copy rho U if you wanted, but I will copy the U there. So what does that give me? At this grid point, I have prescribed P naught and T naught and now what we need to do is a little gas dynamics, right. Given given u that I've extrapolated u, I use energy equation. What does it tell me? One-dimensional energy equation, not the differential equation that we are using. CPT plus u squared by two. And if you give me the u and you give me the t naught, this tells me that t equals t naught minus u squared by 2 Cp, is that fine? And once I have T by T naught, I can find P by P naught, 
right. So, from T by T naught I can find P by P naught and consequently I can find P. And given P and T I can use equation of state, I can use equation of state or I can I guess I might as well write P equals rho RT for example and find rho. Now you are set, now you have everything, you have rho, you have rho u squared, you, right, you can calculate everything, you have Q tilde and therefore you can find Q, right, is that okay, fine. What about the right hand side? I have only I have only prescribed at this point, I have only P ambient prescribed at this point, right. I only have P ambient prescribed at that point at time level Q. Remember this is not the initial condition, initial condition we knew everything. This is at some time level Q, just in case you are wondering what is the deal, that is why it is at time level Q, right. So we have only P ambient at that point, clearly not enough, I need 3 quantities. Right, so I need to extrapolate two. Fine. How do, what what can I extrapolate? The different variations and all that you can do. Right, there are so many possibilities. Even upstream, there are so many possibilities. You could have extrapolated p instead of u. Am I making sense? So this, these are things that one can try out. There's lots of scope for you to play around here. Okay. So one possibility is that, for example, you say that. Uh, there are no sources and heat sources, energy sources in between, right. Maybe I extrapolate T naught, possibly. I could extrapolate T naught and U. I could extrapolate T naught and U, possibly. I am just making a suggestion, right. The point that I am trying to make is that you need to extrapolate two quantities. I have to see these are, quant these are boundary conditions that I have to generate. They do not exist, the physics does not provide them, the mathematics is not right now giving me a clue. We will we'll look at it to see whether we can use the differential equation somehow to generate these, is that fine, okay. So if I extrapolate the T naught, if I extrapolate the T naught and U, what do we get? Again if I extrapolate the T naught and U, I can find the static temperature. And given the pressure and static temperature, I can find the density. It's the same game. Then you can go through, right? Is that fine, everyone? Okay. It seems like a rather arbitrary thing to do. It seems like a rather arbitrary thing to do. So this is something that uh, you can try out. As I said, it, it leaves scope. So you can try, it, let's say, to extrapolate uh, density and rho and rho u or rho and u. Right, there are various quantities that the thing that you want to make sure you do not do, these are, th these are things that you have to be careful with. You already have P ambient here, you do not want to really extrapolate density and temperature for instance because potentially you could violate equation of state at that point. Am I making sense, right? If the pressure here is different from the pressure here, by extrapolating the density and temperature you could potentially violate equation. So there you have to be very careful what, what quantities you are extrapolating. But you could try, you could try out various quantities, some of them may be totally unstable, they may not work at all, right. You could try out various quantities but these are, these are some thing that I thought okay, we can just start with, is that fine, is that okay. Can I justify that, is it possible for me to justify that, maybe I will stick with this, is it possible for me to justify that, justify extrapolating these uh, quantities, okay. So the question is when can I do this, what are the conditions, is there what, is there any uh, inherent assumption that I have made, I am saying there are these quantities, can I always extrapolate, will it always work, okay. So let us go back, let us go back, remember that this could be written as dou Q dou T plus A do q do x equals 0 and this could be further decoupled into 3 equations. I am going to write now component form do q i caret do t plus lambda i do q i caret do x 
equals 0 right where q1 hat q2 hat q3 hat are the characteristic variables we are not going to solve the equation in this form because multiple dimensions anyway it is not going to help us right so that it does not make sense going there but it is useful to look at and what are lambda i lambda 1 is u lambda 2 is u plus c and lambda 3 was u minus c this is what we found is that fine okay now we will actually investigate these equations so if you look at one equation if you look at one equation you have dou q1 hat dou t plus u dou q1 hat dou x equals 0 that says that q1 hat is being propagated along a characteristic I just draw a small figure here first so at this point q1 hat is being propagated along a characteristic whose slope is 1 by u whose slope is 1 by u what about q2 hat q2 hat is being propagated along that and this is this corresponds to so I won't write the 1 by u and so on I'll just write out what character characteristic this corresponds to so this corresponds to u this cor corresponds to u plus c and q3 hat u plus c or u minus c u minus c this is u minus c and that is u plus c remember this is x so it's traveling faster this is u plus c okay so if this is u minus c u u plus c and all the slopes are positive what does that tell you about this flow u minus c u is greater than c so this actually corresponds to supersonic flow so this actually corresponds to supersonic flow that is u greater than c right so if you are talking about subsonic flow if you are talking about subsonic flow in the xt plane right you would have u plus c there you would have u here and you would have u minus c headed out in the other direction am I making sense okay because u minus c will be negative this is for u less than c this is for u less than c everyone okay so at a subsonic inlet at a at a boundary condition go back to those boundary conditions so if this happens to be subsonic if that boundary happens to be subsonic okay that boundary happens to be subsonic or if you look at what happens to the first interior grid points if the flow is subsonic these are the grid points if the flow is subsonic if the flow is subsonic what happens at this point so you have one characteristic which is u minus c maybe I'll use a different color here u minus c you have one characteristic which is u and one characteristic which is u plus c is that fine actually I sort of deliberately drew this characteristic this way this if you go up, think about your stability condition or the grid size is too the delta t is too large all of these characteristics should be above that right just go back think about your stability condition but we are going to look at the stability issues in this seriously anyway but I thought I would just sort of stick that there I could resist the temptation to have that right so you could have a u plus c that is going that way is that fine okay so what this basically says is there is one characteristic that is propagating q1 hat or q3 hat in this case as propagating q3 hat in that direction outward direction right and if I look at if I look at the boundary itself at the boundary itself at the boundary itself 
since the flow is subsonic I have one characteristic that is propagating Q3 hat out and I have two characteristics that are propagating Q1 hat and Q2 hat in is that fine and if it is a subsonic exit I would have the same situation so I draw at the last but one point so I would have U plus C here I have U there I do not know why I am putting arrowheads and I have U minus C here I guess I am looking at it I am putting arrowheads because instinctively I am looking at it as being propagated along that direction right okay. So in which case then you have Q1 hat going out Q2 hat going out Q3 hat coming in okay. Now when I look at the problem when I look at the physical problem that we prescribe we prescribe P0 T0 two incoming characteristics two quantities prescribed right that is nice and I prescribe P ambient one incoming characteristic coming into the domain one quantity prescribed right. So the mathematics and the physical the experiment that they, they are the same I am happy with that right that we, are, we are happy with the way that worked out and we are extrapolating two quantities we should be extrapolating Q1 hat and Q2 hat obviously that would be the way to do it right and we will see how we go about doing that. So there are two quantities that we are extrapolating that correspond to in our mind now the characteristics u and u plus c right and the one quantity say I am giving you a rational it is a hand waving argument I should what is being propagated or q1 hat q2 hat q3 hat that is what are being propagated but I am I sort of say well I will extrapolate the u it is easier to extrapolate the u instead of going through all these characteristic variables fine if it works well I am willing to live with it right. But as I said we will also look at the legal way to the legally the proper way to do it is that fine are there any questions okay okay so this is this is one one uh, mechanism by which we can apply boundary conditions as I said we will come back to we will revisit boundary conditions again it is not it does not end with this right but this is something that you can definitely implement and try out but before you do that the question that we have is is the is it going to be is it going to be stable is it going to work right or do we need to do something it is FTCS so is this is this going to work or do we need to do something so we come, come back to our original equation how can we what is the how do we do the analysis how can we do the stability analysis for this now we have a system of equations earlier we had only one static situation now we have a system of equations what do we do any suggestion Well, there are different ways to do this. Maybe we'll I'll I'll cheat a little. Right? There are different ways to do this. One, you could write it in terms of delta Qs and so on. But let me just I'll just do a little cheat here. So first, uh, we'll use the shift operator, right, and get this E out. So Q Q P Q P Q plus one equals Q P Q minus delta T by 2 delta X E P Q into E power I N delta X minus E power minus I N delta X obviously there has to be a 2 pi by L and so on right I am acting as though that I am going to wave my hands a little and say that okay L was 2 pi okay and I do not know whether you check this out right I, the, the reason why I said I will do a little cheat is because in this particular case it turns out that E is E can be actually written as AQ right you know whether you have tried it out but E can actually be written as AQ it so happens E can be written as AQ okay. So consequently this is going to turn out to be QPQ plus 1 equals QPQ
okay. So what I will do is I know I am going to replace an AQ here, I am going to have an AQ here, okay, I am going to have an AQ here. Oh, let me okay. Minus delta t by two delta x. You already see that a p q q p q. What is e power i n delta x minus e power minus i n delta x? Two i, two i sin. I'll call it theta, where theta is n delta x. Okay. As earlier, the two twos go away. So I can write this as q p q plus one equals i minus. delta t by delta x i sin theta a p q q p q which of course is a very familiar looking the only difference is that they are all matrices it looks familiar but they are all matrices. What now? There is one way to decouple it. We could pre-multiply the equation by x inverse, right? Okay. Where x is the matrix of eigenvectors. If I pre-multiply the equation by x inverse, and of course I can choose x inverse so that it's normalized in some sense, right? It does no stretching, only rotations. I can take unit vectors. Right, x inverse q p q plus one equals x inverse minus delta t by delta x i have uh, that right x inverse a x x inverse uh, q this is i minus delta t by delta x little i the lambda into x inverse q p sin theta oh sin theta very important how can I forget my sin theta thank you remember x inverse q is not they are not the characteristic variables right x inverse q is not they are not the characteristic variables characteristic variables are related through the idea of a derivative dq caret is x inverse dq characteristic variables are related this fashion right and this is some strange map we are just doing some we are just doing some kind of a transformation am i making sense so in a sense this gives me some i'll just give it a name s so that you don't confuse it with q caret I right, will just give it some, some name q p q plus 1 so I want you to be careful here right is okay.
now i just take the i take the norm i take the norm i want the norm of this divided by the norm of that norm of spq plus 1 divided by norm of spq equals norm of this we have seen as an iteration matrix before when we did Laplace's equation right system of equations think back to the example that I did with Laplace's equation I had a scalar equation I performed a rotation right I had two scalar equations I performed a rotation and showed that they became coupled right two scalar equations I made them into a coupled system by performing a rotation I am doing the opposite here right I have a coupled system of equations and I am trying to undo the coupling I am trying to undo the coupling so uh, we could we might as well take the spectral norm what is the the largest eigenvalue is what determined right the largest eigenvalue is what determined whether that sequence of iterations converged or not I could have used just used that argument directly but I just wanted to tie it up with this we have actually done this before right we have actually done this before so what is the largest eigenvalue u plus c would uh, looks like the largest eigenvalue but you do not know the sign of u you understand what I am saying so the largest eigenvalue are u plus a they use c throughout it does not matter c and a there okay right fine u plus a it looks like or u plus c whatever so mod u plus a or mod u plus c since I have been using right in general mod u plus a would be the largest second value okay in this case it is clearly going to be unconditionally unstable it is clearly going to be unconditionally unstable just like it was for FTCS applied to any one of the equations scalar equations. So I could add I can add what do I want to add I can add artificial dissipation that will make it upwinding right what was the term that I wanted to add what is the term that I want to add I can add a mu 2 do squared q do x squared right and subtract out a mu 2 do to the fourth q by do x to the fourth is that fine okay fine uh, I usually prefer to write this in terms of uh, because if you think about the term that we added to eliminate I prefer to add a delta x squared and but it does not matter you can add you will see as you go along here I would rather make it a mu 2 delta x squared rho squared q by rho x squared or you can try this four say delta x to the fourth right see if you think there is any difference and of course the minute I give you two options like this one of the one thing one possibility that catches I can see a few smiles out there is obviously that you can try a mu 2 delta x and see what happens right see what happens what are the right now I am not going to give you any helpful hints on what possible values of mu 2 may work right you, you try it out you see what it is you already have remember what we have done for the one dimensional flow right you already have enough. Uh, you have already have enough of a background to figure out what you need to add fine the only difference there is there you had only one propagation speed a here you have three propagation speeds right that is a problem you have u u plus a and u minus a right and after adding these this dissipation term if you do get a stability condition that corresponds to the CFL less than this CFL condition that is sigma less than 1 which sigma do you use right because there are three sigmas actually so for the wave equation you only had sigma right one sigma but here you have sigma u plus c sigma u minus c or u minus a u minus a 
and sigma u. There are three, three possible sigma because there are three propagation speeds, right? And all of them have to be less than one. Even if you do this, even if you do this, right? And if you go back to upwinding, you basically add the right amount. That's a, that's the clue. You add the right amount, it goes back to upwinding. Which one do you add? Which one do you which which is the most constraining one? Which of these is the most constraining one? That would seem to be u plus a, right? Would seem to be u plus a. So along these lines, I will write again that you want sigma, the one that constrains to be mod u plus a delta t by delta x. Is that fine? But remember that you can actually define three of them because there are three propagation speeds. You can actually define three of them. Are there any questions? This is fine. Okay. So you can ask the question why are we bothered with FTCS when we know that it is unconditionally unstable, right? You say, why the heck are you wasting our time? when you know it is unconditionally unstable. Fine, I know that we can add this, right, we can, we can do something with it. Let us go to, let us go to a more uh, sensible scheme that we had, but the only problem there was, what was the problem? BTCS, BTCS, the advantage was, BTCS you may also see it as backward Euler, centered space, whatever, BTCS unconditionally stable. It gave you a system of equation, right? And here we already have a system, so now we have to be a bit careful, right? We have to see what what does that mean. So what 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 does the we did a semi discretization? If you remember when we did this, delta q by delta t plus dou by dou x. I'm going to write this in the delta form. E at delta q by delta t at time level p q and this is at time level p q plus 1, q plus 1. I want to write dou q dou t at time level q plus 1 and this equals 0, okay. And just like we did last time e q plus 1. is eq plus dou e dou t at q times delta t plus higher order terms okay I am going to truncate the series here. Anyway, I am planning to do only backward, right? Backward Euler or backward time, backward step. And again, I will use chain rule. E is a function of Q. So, dou E dou T, I will write as dou E dou Q, dou Q dou T. Okay. So that this equation becomes delta q plus delta t times dou by dou x of a delta q equals minus delta t into dou e dou x. This is at q, this is all at p. Is that fine, everyone? So, dou q dou t plus dou e dou x equals 0. If I am looking only for the steady state, seeking steady state. 
I will tell you what we will do when if we are going to look for a transient but right now we will look for only the steady state seeking steady state. So this bit tells me that dou E dou X equals 0 is the equation that I am actually trying to solve okay. So that equation can be written as I plus delta T dou by dou X A acting on delta Q is minus delta T into some matrix R. just like we got for the wave equation the generalized wave equation but there is a little difference here what is the difference each of the delta q's each of the delta q's is a matrix it is a vector so each of these entries is a vector is a matrix right so what does this equation look like if we write it for an arbitrary pq if we write it for an arbitrary point p Right, what does this and if you use central differences to discretize that use central differences to discretize that this is going to give me delta q p q I won't write the q it is at time q right delta p at delta q at p plus delta t times a p plus 1 delta q p plus 1 minus a p plus 1 a p minus 1 delta q p minus 1 equals R at P okay. So you will get a tridiagonal system you get a tridiagonal system but the point is that each entry in the tridiagonal system is a, a block a matrix block. So the general equation will turn out so you will get a tridiagonal system what I mean by that is you will get something so this will be delta q p right so this is the equation p going through and what you would get here is what is on the diagonal there is an identity matrix on the diagonal right there is a a p minus 1 delta t by 2 delta x on the sub diagonal and there is an a p plus 1 delta t by 2 delta x on the super diagonal you understand what I am saying that is the diagonal that is the sub diagonal that is the super diagonal everyone is that fine. And each of these entries, each of these entries is a matrix. Each of these entries is a matrix A P minus 1 delta T by 2 delta X, just to make it clear. I A P plus 1 delta T by 2 delta X. Those are the entries in the matrix. Okay. So if you decide, for example, to do uh, Gaussian elimination you decide for example that you want to do Gaussian elimination right. So where in Gaussian elimination you would say divide through by the pivot element here you have to pre multiply by the inverse am I making sense pre multiply by the inverse fine if you are planning to do this if you are planning to do that it is better that you factor this AP-1 using LU decomposition right you are, there is always this question when you do numerical linear algebra. Uh, you know that LU decomposition and Gaussian elimination are essentially the same right LU decomposition and Gaussian elimination operation for operation you can actually show that they are essentially the same am I making sense okay and you do a, you do the elimination part of Gaussian elimination you end up with a upper triangular matrix you do LU decomposition you have a lower triangular upper triangular you do a forward substitution of the L you end up with an upper triangular matrix you would expect that you can map the two operations together you actually can you can show that they are equivalent okay you can show that they are operation for operation you can actually identify that they are equivalent fine. So then the question always crops up, crops up why would you choose one over the other well if you do LU decomposition if you factor it as L and U then you only have back substitutions and forward substitutions. 
you pre factor this as L and U, if you were going to multiply through by right the inverse, you could actually do back substitutions, forward substitutions, and back substitutions. That is the idea, fine. That is if you are using if you are using Gaussian elimination, even if you want to do Gauss Seidel, you are doing an iterative method, you may still have to do something of that sort. But of course, Gauss Seidel, the big advantage is the diagonal matrix here is I, right. So, Gauss Seidel is not that bad, Gauss Seidel it is not that bad. Am I making sense? If you are using an iterative matrix, it is not that bad. There may be consequences, but it is not that bad, okay. Is that fine, everyone? Okay. So then we have only one question let, left, how do we apply boundary conditions here? We have a system of equations, how do we apply boundary conditions here? In this problem, how do we apply boundary conditions? Let me see where is the best place for us to discuss that, maybe I will do it here. How do we apply boundary conditions here? So in the application of boundary conditions, we need to maybe look at it a little more carefully. Again, I will draw two timelines q and q plus 1. Like I did the first time around, I am not going to choose, I am going to just choose a few grid points. I won't choose a lot of grid points so that it does not become too messy, right. And what I had indicated at that time is oh, you need a you need a value here that you can you can extrapolate some quantity from the interior, say for instance T naught or uh, u or whatever or we said that from here you can extrapolate the u, right. It need not be from the current time level to the current time level, right. Right now what we want is we want the value here. So actually you could instead of instead of extrapolating from the current time level to the current time level, you could actually propagate. Now that looks more like, that looks more like our characteristics. You could actually propagate from the previous time level to the current time level. You could extrapolate both in space and in time. There are so many different ways by which you can do this, right. You can extrapolate both in space and in time. The interior value goes from the last but one grid point at the previous time level to the time level to which you are stepping, fine, okay. That is possible. I mean if you are going to do it hand wavingly that is possible. So in a similar fashion even here you could do the same thing. By the way this does this I am suggesting this, this suggestion comes to mind only because we are looking at an implicit scheme but even in the case of FTCS we could have done that. Even in the case of FTCS, even in the case of FTCS you are going to use this tensile, even in the case of FTCS you are going to use this tensile, you assume at uh, the initial condition this is known you find all the interior points then you can ask the question what do I do at the boundary and you can actually extrapolate from the current time level to the next time level even in FTCS, am I making sense, right. Even in FTCS you could do that and then when you go Q to Q plus 1 when you go to the next step Q becomes Q plus 1 you have everything at the current time level. So the minute you start this, so it is this uh, we needed the conditions the conditions were required because of the scheme that we came up with. We have no physical basis by which we can justify this. Right now the only mathematical basis that we have done is oh the characteristics are propagating in that direction so that rationalizes why I am extrapolating that is all we have done. The question that we can ask is cannot we just directly use the characteristics themselves, why not just use the characteristic equations, am I making sense, why not just use the characteristic equations directly and say that at all of these interior points we use the regular equations and at the boundaries we will do something with the with the equations uh, say in characteristic forms or we will allow we will use the equation in characteristic form to determine what is the boundary condition, what is the equation that is solved at this point, am I making sense, we will, we will admit that only P0 and T0 is provided here which means that from the differential equation we need we need one differential equation for one parameter to be solved at the boundary. Am I making sense? Okay, and it's the same thing at the right hand end. That is, you have p ambient and uh, p ambient provided. You have only one condition given, so two of them should come from the interior. 
is that okay right so in the next class what we will try to do is we will try to determine how do we apply these boundary conditions using the equations governing equations themselves is that fine okay thank you